If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13. And as you turn there, there's this quote, history is written by the victors. This quote was attributed to Winston Churchill, but I'm sure he's not the first person who said that. The idea that the history that we have written down and the, the things that we know are kind of like a point of view of what was happening at the time and especially dependent on who were conquerors at the time and those who had power and prestige and money at the time. Particular elements of history are highlighted and other parts are lost. And you know, unfortunately, you know, we as human beings, as academics, it's very easy to be puffed up in our understanding of life based on the way that we've learned things. But there are so many things to learn that go beyond the things that we have classified in our minds as our education. Sometimes it's just a perspective. And it is no different as it relates to leadership, and particularly to those who aspire to leadership. There is an idea in this day and age that leadership has to do with strength, leadership has to do with money, leadership has to do with prestige. But as we can clearly see in our experience here in this country and of course across the world, that money, prestige, and this idea of just raw strength is no guarantee of character, is no guarantee of the truth. And unfortunately, this idea, this love for the truth has been replaced with an idea of just wanting to win by any means necessary. Why? Because the victors are the ones who write history. And unfortunately, this kind of mentality is raising up around us in this world a lot of people who call themselves leaders who are not really leaders. They're more so people who are using their position as a means to win. Even right now, where our world stands at the verge of a very, very serious worldwide conflict. In the land of Ukraine, where right now millions of people are fleeing for their lives, there is someone who calls himself a leader who is saying, literally, that what is happening in Ukraine is taking place to protect the people of Ukraine. It is also happening because people are being subjected to bullying and genocide. And the whole idea is to demilitarize and to denazifize Ukraine. You know, we have our own two eyes and we can literally see what is happening there. And even in the midst of what we are seeing, there are people who call themselves leaders who are telling us blatant lies to our face in the name of leadership, in the name of strength and power and money. And you see, unfortunately, this kind of mentality about leadership makes a lot of people wonder if they can really believe what they see with their own two eyes. I'm sure there are some people who because of these words and these thoughts and these lies that are being spread, some people who are even questioning whether or not they should have sympathy upon the poor, sympathy upon those who are displaced, sympathy upon those who are dying. Can you believe it? Where we would question the truth because of this idea of worshiping so-called leaders? My friend, there is no leader. No true leader, no good leader, who will lie for the name, for the sake of power. No good leader will do that. So then what do we have, Pastor Andrew, if they're not leaders? Well, we have power mongers. And we have people who desire to use their position for selfish purposes or for ideological purposes that exclude other people's rights to live, other people's rights to defer. 
That, my friends, is what despots do. Don't get leadership and despotism mixed up, especially in the church of Jesus Christ. Because, my friend, we are run by a totally different idea. The idea that every single person, man, woman, boy, or girl, no matter what race, no matter what ethnicity and background, it doesn't matter. All are created in the image of God and all are worthy of the dignity of being respected for that and honored for that and treated with love because of that. We don't need despots in the church of Jesus Christ. We don't need people who believe that their ideology and thoughts about life are more important than any other person's. We need people who are in total submitted to the dignity and the, the rights of, of people's humanity that has been given to them by God himself. You can believe what you see with your own two eyes. Don't let the dark spiritual times trick you into misunderstanding what leadership is. And if ever there was a time when the church of Jesus Christ needed leaders, true leaders, it is now. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that when it comes to the gift of leadership, that leaders should do their ministry with diligence. The idea there is earnestness or zeal. Leadership is about action and inspiration. It is not about commanding people to do what you want them to do. It is about action and inspiration. As I said before, money, prestige, Popularity should never be a factor for selecting leaders, especially in the church of Jesus Christ. Because money, prestige, and popularity do not equate to the simple reality of dedication and character which is needed in order to be a leader in the church of Jesus Christ. It is better to have an ounce of character than to have billions of dollars in your pocket. Character pleases God. Money passes away. And so when the church of Jesus Christ is looking for leadership, look at the heart. Now I'm obviously not talking about perfect people. There is no perfect person but God himself. But if you want a leader, you have to look at the heart of someone who is desirous of being like Jesus. Someone who is desirous of walking the path. Someone who is desirous of not only showing an example of righteousness, but teaching that example to other people. You say, well, Pastor Andrew, there are so many different kinds of administrative jobs within the church. You got people who take care of the money, people who clean the floors, people who take care of pastoring the people of God, people who take care of those kinds of things. And yes, but let me tell you something. In every one of those areas, the call for leadership and the qualification for leadership is the same. Character is necessary, not perfection but a heart and desire to want to be more like Christ. And those who have those gifts can be used mightily by God in any area of administration within the church of Jesus Christ. It's not about winning or getting your way. That's the way despots think. It's about the upliftment and blessing and edification of the body of Christ. That is what leadership is for. I want to look, as I said earlier, on John chapter 13 and see just three things in that passage of scripture that help us to understand what a good leader is and what a good leader does. Let's pray. Father, speak to us now as we look at this passage of scripture. Help us to understand spiritual leadership as you have given it to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. John chapter 13, I want to read from verse 12. This is Jesus as he supped, his, had, his, had his final supper with his disciples. Verse 12 says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, 
Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. A good leader from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself and from the example that he set. That kind of leader looks very different than the leadership around us today, or what we call leadership today. It is not braggadocious. It is not loud. It is not desirous of center stage all the time. It is not necessarily even desirous of having its own way. You see, leadership in God's understanding of it, in God's way of helping us to understand it, is all about the blessing and, and, and the giving of oneself for someone else's benefit. It is a selfless act. When you come into the church of Jesus Christ and you want to be a leader, it's not just so you can have a title. It's not for usher or deacon or pastor. Those things mean nothing. They're all equate to the same job, servant. And what is a servant? One who is there for the blessing and benefit of someone else. And of course, to do exactly what it is their master has asked them to do. That may put kind of a, a different look on this whole idea of leadership within the church of Jesus Christ. Because it's not for me. It's not for my benefit primarily. I'm not doing it so that I can have some kind of, of legacy for myself. No. I am doing it out of a love and commitment to God first and out of a love and desire for your blessing and your benefit. And Jesus exemplified that even here at his final supper with his disciples, instead of spending time giving them just another wonderful lecture, he does something that seems out of character for a rabbi. He gets up from the head of the table, he gets down on his knees with a bucket and a rag, and he washes their feet. He does something that the common house servant at the time would be doing. Only he has the position as head of the table. That should tell us something. You see, the head of the table in God's eyes is not about the prestige position. It is about the first servant. The one who is serving first. And why is that? Because this whole idea of the church is not our thing, it's God's thing. And God has set up leaders not to take his place, but to be the ones to exemplify how everyone within that organization should be. Servants. So if you consider yourself a leader, you're only the first servant. And that is important. There's no place for pride. There's no place for boasting. There's no place for thinking of myself as a reverend as opposed to a simple minister. There is no place for that. This world will tell us that those things are important. But in God's eyes, those things mean nothing if we don't have a servant's heart. Servant leadership. That is the idea of Christian spiritual leadership. Now let's look at three things that a good leader is and three things that they do. The first thing is found in verses 12 and 13. It says there, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Is Jesus gloating? <laughs> It's Jesus saying, hey, I am your teacher and Lord. 
and you're right for saying that. Is he gloating? No. He is stating something that is very important to spiritual leadership. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to know that Jesus Christ is your teacher and your master. If you are going to lead as he did, you have to acknowledge that he is the blueprint. He is the one every single one of us need to be submitting our hearts or minds and seek to emulate. He's the one. Jesus didn't say, I am your master and teacher so that he could gloat. He said that to point their attention to the where you need to begin as a leader. You have to begin with Jesus. He is the example. He's the one. Acknowledge him. First of all, you can't be a leader in the church of Jesus Christ if you don't know who Jesus is. If you don't know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and teacher. You know, I've heard some, even from some leaders say, who would say to me that, you know, Jesus' words, you know, they're very helpful and so on, but you can ignore them sometimes. Because sometimes they don't work necessarily for your benefit. So you can skip over the non-beneficial portions of scripture and you can find the ones that please you and live by those. That's someone who just doesn't understand this whole life. You see, Jesus is not, is not someone who is your genie in a bottle as I've said so many times. Jesus is about ownership, rule. If there's going to be an autocrat, it has to be God. Not sinful men or sinful men's ideas. It has to be God. Why? Because God will not lie. God will not steal anything from you. God has come to give you life. Trust in him and you will receive life. That might not be that way for sinful men. But you can trust God. Acknowledging him as your master and teacher is where it begins. You see, us as leaders, as spiritual leaders, are always in the process of learning and growing spiritually. But you can't learn and you can't grow spiritually if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Master. And if he can't teach you. Have you ever met someone who is not teachable? Like, like you can say the same thing to them over and over again. They'll just ignore you and keep doing what they're doing. Those are the hardest people to work with. <laughs> Because no matter how much information comes before them, no matter how much they should be learning, they're never learning. They're never learning because they think they know it all. But in this thing, in this thing called the church of Jesus Christ, no one knows it all except for God. And it is in acknowledging him first that we even begin to learn anything. I really and truly from the depths of my heart don't believe that anyone should be a leader in the church of Jesus Christ if they are not a born again Christian. How can you lead in something that is spiritual when you yourself are not spiritual? The beginning of spiritual life is accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Why? Because the Bible says outside of him, we are dead in trespasses and sins. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If we, if we want to be leaders, if we want to inspire people towards God, we need to know God ourselves. Acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge your teacher. And if every day you don't wake up asking the Lord to rule things in your life, asking him to lead you into the truth, asking him to guide you into becoming a better, a better leader in the church of Jesus Christ, then you, my friend, are not going to be effective for God. The gift of leadership begins by acknowledging Jesus as Savior. And Jesus makes it very clear here. I am your teacher. I am your Lord. If you, as a spiritual leader, don't wake up every day asking God to direct you and show you how to lead, 
you are missing out on your greatest resource. You can go to as many websites as you like. You can download as many programs and diplomas and get as many degrees as you would like in your understanding and in your education about God. But without the master teacher in your heart guiding you and directing you into his will, you will be deficient in being able to inspire people to grow in spirit. So you have to know and you have to be clear. As a leader myself, there are not many people that I will listen to and take advice from, especially when it comes to leadership in particular churches. You know, one experience in one church will not necessarily help you in your experience with another church. You have to lean on the Holy Spirit for guidance and direction in those ways. And there are pastors right now spinning their wheels, trying to do things ministry-wise, and they're getting frustrated and fed up and nothing is working because they haven't taken the time to ask the master teacher. That may be exactly what God is asking you to do right now. Acknowledge him. What does he say? In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will do what? Direct your path. So a good leader acknowledges their master and their teacher. The second thing is found in verses 14 and 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. So not only should a good leader acknowledge who their teacher and master is, a good leader must do what their teacher and master does. Jesus said when he left, when he was about to leave, greater things than what I have done, you will do. How is that possible that we can do greater things than Jesus did? Wasn't he the perfect one? No, he was giving us a sign. He was giving us guidance. He was saying, as you depend on the Holy Spirit in your life, as you submit yourself to me as master teacher, you will not only do what I've done, but you'll do things even beyond what I've done. Why? Because I will empower you to those things. And God cannot lie. Jesus just finished washing their feet. And he asked them, do you understand what I've done? I did this to show you what spiritual leadership looks like. Spiritual leaders, though they sit at the head of the table, get up and wash the dirty feet of those whom they love. That's what it means to be a leader. It might not always be limelight. It might not always feel good. It might not always look good. But it is always for God's glory and for the benefit of others. Do as I have done. You know, I remember once uh, trying to um, wash, wash the feet of some leaders that I was mentoring at the time. And I remember saying to them, hey, take your shoes off. I'm about to wash your feet. And people got extremely upset. <laughs> they got a little bit uncomfortable because people started to get very self-conscious. You know, I mean... Um, my toes might not be well done, I, I, I don't, my feet might be all ashy and things like that. And my thought was, you know, it really has nothing to do with the way your feet are. It has everything to do with my heart towards you. So whether you want your feet washed or not, know this, that I am willing to serve you. Even in situations like that, I am willing to serve. If you call yourself a leader and you're not willing to get down on your hands and knees and do some dirty work, you got to grow up. You have to grow up in the spirit. Because leadership is not always limelight. Sometimes you have to vacuum the floors. Sometimes you have to take care of the garbage. Sometimes you have to meet people at their lowest, not when they're feeling good about seeing you, but when they need to see you. Sometimes it's doing the hard work of rebuking someone who might not necessarily think they're doing anything wrong. 
but always in a spirit of love and humility because we all fail. You see, my friends, leadership is not what these despots tell you it is. It's not about the popularity contest. It's not about the money. It's not about the prestige. It's who can be most like our Lord and Savior Jesus. The Bible said that he had absolutely no place to lay his head. He didn't have a home like most of us do. He was in dangers here and there. We are relatively in safety. Many of us who operate as spiritual leaders, why is it so difficult to be like Jesus? Because many of us just can't give up the comforts that we have gotten so used to. But if you're going to be a good leader, you have to give up those comforts. You have to exemplify it, not just talk about it. So a good leader acknowledges their teacher and master. But a good leader also does what their teacher and master does. And thirdly and finally, in verse 16, it says there, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. You've heard me quote this verse many, many times because it is a verse that truly keeps me grounded. It's a verse that focuses my attention. You see, God has given us so many great and wonderful spiritual gifts, and it's very easy to take these spiritual gifts and to kind of become puffed up about it, especially if you have one or two or three. It's very easy to say, I am good at this, and this is my thing. But Jesus reminds us once again here, he says it very clearly, the servant is never greater than his master. Why does he say that? Why does he emphasize that here? It is because every single leader is used to exerting their authority to influence other people. However, if you're going to be a good leader, you have to remain under authority. You hear me? You have to remain under authority to whom? To the teacher and master Jesus. You can't just acknowledge him as your savior and then go about thinking, I don't need him now. I do my own thing. No, that's not the way it works. You must always remain under the authority of the teacher, under the authority of the master. Why? Because you'll never ever attain to his level. You will always need his help and you will always need his power. And you cannot access that power if your power is greater than his. I hope you understand me, because in a true sense, you will never be greater in power than Jesus, but you can act that way. You can ignore his teachings. You can his, ignore his guidance. You can ignore the need to be disciplined in your devotional studies. You can ignore those things. But let me say this, my friend, you will never be a good teacher until you live under his rules. This is Jesus' church. Not yours, pastor. Not yours, deacon. It is Jesus' church. If that is the case, we must always submit ourselves to what he wants, not what we want. Why is it so hard for churches to expand their ministries and to think outside of the box in terms of reaching people for Christ or in terms of reaching their community and taking care of those who are most in need? It is because a lot of times we're just not living under the authority of Jesus. We're living under the authority of our budgets or the authority of those who control the purses or the authority of the people who preach from the pulpit who don't have a heart for Jesus. And let me be clear, just because somebody preaches from a pulpit doesn't mean they have a heart for Jesus. A lot of people do these things as hobbies or do these things because they can't do anything else. But let me say this, if you are truly under the authority of Jesus, it will show in terms of your willingness to give up what you want for the purposes of Jesus to be accomplished. One of the things that's hard, you know, and I explain to people sometimes is the history of a church is not going to determine in any way its sustainability and its future. The history of a church is someone's perspective of, of that church's success. 
But the history of a church cannot determine whether that church will subsist or continue to be blessed by Jesus Christ. What the only thing that will keep that church subsisting and going on is as that church submits itself to the guidance and direction of Jesus. And any good leader is going to direct that church in that direction. Sometimes when you do that, a lot of people don't like it because it means we have to change a lot of things. Well, that's just a testament to where we were going wrong. If doing what Jesus wants us to do makes us change a lot, then yes, praise God, let's change. Because we want to please him. If there's very little changes, little tweaks that need to happen, praise God for that. Because every single change that pleases Jesus is something that he will bless in the long run. And leaders must be strong in heart and determined, regardless of opposition, to lead people in that direction. That is why spiritual leaders aren't necessarily always revered. Sometimes true spiritual leaders are looked down on. Sometimes people really can't stand them <laughs> because they, t they tend to pull people out of their comfort zones to do things that people would normally not want to do. But let me be clear on this. If someone is pulling you to the will of God, then they're a good leader, not a bad leader. They're a good leader. A good leader is someone who acknowledges their teacher and master. Someone who does what their teacher and master does. And of course, someone who remains under the authority of their teacher and master, regardless of opposition. Leadership is needed in the church of Jesus Christ now more than ever because it is so easy to want to water down the content of the scriptures so that people might think that you're a cool church. Or it's very easy to water down your your desire for spiritual growth and development and for people to demonstrate their spiritual growth in the way that they live and speak. People want to eliminate that because, let's face it, it's very hard to find true spiritual character in days like these. But oh my friend, I can tell you this, that as a, as a leader myself, there is nothing more wonderful than to watch God mold a spiritual leader. To see someone go from spiritual immaturity to maturity as they simply live out what it is they're learning about Jesus. And then God begins to show how these people are influencers and can be used in administration of God's church. Why? Because people respect them and will follow them because of their spiritual character. It's a beautiful thing to see. My prayer for myself is to be a good spiritual leader in every respect, to acknowledge and be humble about my shortcomings, but at the same time to be in full pursuit, full sprinted pursuit of becoming what God wants me to be. That's the best that I can do. And that is my wish, and not just my wish, but God's wish for every single spiritual leader. If you believe you have this gift, ask God. God, do I know you? God, am I doing what you told me to do? Lord, every day am I submitting to your teaching and your mastery in my life? As you do these things, you will be the good leader and you will receive the commendation that God wants to give you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for so much for your example. Even during this Lenten season, it's so wonderful to see what Jesus himself did. He got down on his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet because he is a true example of servant leadership. Help us to emulate him. Help us to be like him. Lord God, we in a very special way pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for all those who have been displaced because of the war. Lord, I pray that any despot, anyone who would seek to lie about what is truly happening to people made in your image and in your likeness, I pray, Lord God, that you would put them down in the name of Jesus. Let your truth let the truth be that which guides us, not lies and deceit. We are your people. We must walk in the light as you are in the light. 
help us to get rid of and to shun never to support anything that is in the dark and anything that is filled with lies thank you father god for your love and grace we love you and we pray and ask these mercies in jesus name amen